Well, hello, everyone. Well, hello. I suppose I could say that to the camera. You could. Heidi ho, good neighbors. Do you know what that's from? I think I've already done this many times. Heidi ho, good neighbors. Tim the Tool Man Taylor. Oh, yeah. I didn't really get that show. Which I, and I actually believe it was set in my beloved Michigan, right? Is that right? I don't know. I don't know. I don't As we it. learned last week, I'm not very good with media <laughs> trivia. <laughs> I thought I was going to get fired, everyone, last week when I didn't know enough about Ooh. Star Wars. <laughs> I didn't you know that you was were a gonna fireable get fired or You were going to get everybody fired. <laughs> I didn't know that was a fireable I'm offense. Done with everybody. Raw. <laughs> I love I love that that's the leadership dynamic I bring like <laughs> <laughs> he's like so casual about everything but then Star Wars but you oh. didn't know this piece of trivia <laughs> get out <laughs> get out of my face you disgust no, me is, ho- is it home improvement Tim the Tallman Taylor improvement set in Michigan uh, the reason I think it is is because isn't the guy that's in it like the main guy from Michigan um, one episode has Tim and Al flying home on a plane when the pilot mentions they're close to landing at Detroit Metro Airport. The show is set in Detroit. There we go. Thought so. So I knew that about the show, but Great. I couldn't tell you like what happens in it or anything. Yeah. Well. So Heidi Ho, good neighbors. Heidi Ho, good neighbors. Um, uh, we are living in the light of resurrection. We are. It is post-resurrection sunday and what did you do for two days after easter you know we obviously have this big build up i watched a baby yeah so we both came back to work yesterday and said we've forgotten how to work in two days (laughs) (laughs) yeah i i went to the playground and watched my little daughter learn how to use the slide Uh by herself and she went 50 times yeah I love that season. She also slept really well that night, which was wonderful. So mm-hmm. more slides in the future. That's well, what I, I uh, my family all left today. Yeah. What's going on? So they're all in yeah. Michigan. They just ditched you. Yeah. So actually I will sleep really well the next <laughs> three nights. Which means we got to get a lot done over the next few days. Yes, totally. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You'll be thinking in yeah, I actually, color rather yeah, than I actually, in black and white. I actually have, as well as having a sermon to write, can work. As much as I like without feeling guilty. Um, Isn't that funny that that's what we do? Like, you're like, oh, I get, I'm going to get to focus. And then you're just like, oh, my family's gone. What am I going to do? They are my recreation. Yes. Oh, yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah. yeah so yeah. I guess I'll work. Yeah. I did think about going skiing for a little bit tomorrow morning. But yeah. I also have the dog. The dog was supposed to go. Um, and then we didn't. She's going on Sunday. To someone's house, and so uh, I don't. I feel a little bad about leaving her for multiple hours for no reason. Yeah, um, should have just brought her to work today. But um, yeah, so I will be theoretically getting a lot done in the next three to four days. Yeah. So when you first walked in the room today, you asked me the question: How are we going to do an hour long podcast <laughs> about a twenty five minute sermon? <laughs> And my theory is you should just re-preach it right now. Re-preach? Oh, man. I, I, I'm a bit of a flush guy, like, once I'm done with it. I actually have to think again about what I actually said. I, I'm the same way. Yeah. I've gone back and listened to messages and thought, that I learned stuff from that. Yeah. <laughs> Did I say that? <laughs> man, I'm smarter than I thought. That I've never even heard that before, and yeah. I said it, you know. But I do think so. One of the things that that uh, occurred to me, and things that might be helpful, a little insight into in, in to the world of church for people is actually, uh, in some ways, writing a twenty minute message is harder than a forty minute message. Yeah, you have to be quite determined not to get sidetracked. Yeah, and actually, writing an Easter message can become a little bit of a challenge as well. Yep. Even though it's theoretically easy, and and you do have this beautiful joy of just saying, "Well, I'm just going to point to resurrection," um, you know that that is is beautiful. But but I think the church worldwide can live the Protestant evangelical church. Let me say, can kind of hold this pressure of having to say the the thing that happened in a brand new way. Yeah. Um, 
you know you know that you gotta you gotta spin easter in a new way and of course there's nothing new under the sun yeah last year we did this idea of the stone that keeps moving jesus moved a stone two thousand years ago and he keeps moving and i was listening to saddleback church in a biggest church in the world uh or biggest church in america at one point and and um listening to their easter message from this year and it was like the rolling stone and i was like they stole our idea and yet of course like it wasn't new to us it wasn't new to anybody yeah so so any any sense of feeling that pressure is nonsense but it is real nevertheless yeah um so i think that's a, so those are some of the complexities that hit as but the thing i liked about your message on sunday um there's only one no, I'm sure. Uh, no, one of the things I liked about, <laughs> that's rough. Uh, one of the things I liked about your message is you didn't just focus, or actually, you didn't primarily focus on the physical resurrection of Christ. No, I mean that was implied heavily, obviously, and yeah. it is Resurrection Sunday. But you actually talked about the resurrection of a specific character story, mm. which I just loved that. Because that's actually the implication of resurrection yeah. everywhere. Yeah. I think maybe we do ourselves a disservice by trying to repeat the the specific story of mm. um, the bodily resurrection of Christ. That might be heresy that I'm saying that well, out loud it's... now that I'm, I'm like uncomfortable saying it. But like, I don't know if it's, we, we celebrate that every single Sunday. Mm. Yeah, In we really do. Sense, Sunday is resurrection day. Yeah. And there's just happens to be an a special day every year that's earmarked to to focus on it. Yeah. But um Well so, so, and sometimes yeah. as well, like I think how to say this. So I, I wanted to st- so I started off with uh Luke chapter twenty four, uh, which just has those beautiful words like, Why do you look for the living amongst the dead? He is not here, he is risen. Yeah. Which actually in terms of the details of the resurrection is all the angels actually feel called to say. They don't go into a, like, an excursus on what that means for you as individuals. Like, they don't go into a lot of details about anything. It's a proclamation. Um, Similar to when the, the birth of Jesus was announced similar to different proclamations within scripture. So, so that's what they do. So that's just what I do. Yeah. Um, and then just tried to follow some of the narrative story and what that might mean. Because I'm always intrigued. Like, I love Peter. I, I think a lot of us love Peter because he probably reminds us a bit more of... Like, I feel like if Paul and I talked, we'd have Jesus in common and that was it. <laughs> like, we'd, we'd want to talk about nothing else. <laughs> Whereas Peter, I feel like I'd have more in common with. I don't know. Um, <laughs> That's maybe I'm wrong. But, like, I, I've always, like, had this soft spot for him. He gives me hope for me. Yeah, I get that. Yeah, you know, I get that. Paul's a little too perfect. Well, I feel like Paul's a bit teacher's pettish. Same as John. I mean, I don't know the whole like murdering Christian thing. Yeah, I mean, what? But once he became a Christian, like it feels like he pretty much nails it all the time. Well, yeah, he had some he had some ground to, to make up. <laughs> <laughs> like there's, there's even that that moment he takes Peter aside and lectures him in uh, in uh, is it Philippians where he's like Galatians, you know, Galatians yeah. I told Peter you're the worst. <laughs> I'm like, oh, it sounds so like Paul. Oh no, uh, wait, yeah, maybe it is a different. He, the lecture takes place in Galatians, but then yeah, he, yeah. he talks about it again yeah, elsewhere. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Well. Um, so I love Peter, and we hung out with him a bunch yeah, over the did. course of um, that week and a half leading up to Easter. I, I want to say with no planning whatsoever, but I feel like for the sake of the podcast, I, su- I should say with full intentionality and well planned forethought. Yeah. No. <laughs> um, although it was actually one of those things where the option showed up. Mm. And knowing where you were headed, mm. it like affirmed that option mm. is the right option for yeah. a couple different reasons. Like, um, we didn't spend a ton of time with Peter on Good Friday, but um, oh, but one that, of the yeah. illustrations of Jessica's message about the cross was the song about Peter denying Christ. Which it feels like we should have had Jessica on with us and talked about Good Friday as well. 
um, because her message was just beautiful. Like, yeah. So well constructed. And then Speaking of like difficult to prepare an efficient message, she actually talked about the theological implications of the cross in like 20 minutes. Yes. Maybe even less. Yeah. Um, and it was so poignant because she, which is one of the reasons why Dan asked us to print her manuscript uh-huh. for people. If, if you didn't get a chance to listen to the message, cause it's like, it's dense with theological Sorry, implications. What's a, what's a manuscript? Um, <laughs> it's this thing that some preachers do where they write out what they're going to say in advance. i did not know that was something a person could do (laughs) it is an option (laughs) yeah yes no i have done that i flirted with that i thought i I thought you were manuscripted on sunday because message one and two were pretty darn close i was not manuscripted i went more for a detail detailed outline yeah um but um yeah but it, it was a beautiful message and then jessica's message was a beautiful message and then that song, uh, which was called something weird, like... Jesus is Denied by Peter. Yes. Was just beautiful as well. Like, all the music for Good Friday was just stunning. Like That couple... artist is coming to Denver and offered oh. to do a concert at our church. So what? We can talk about that later, but... We, we should. Yeah, no, I loved that. And I love... I'd never heard the fir- the one you opened with as well, which was called Scandalous Night. Yeah, a beautiful like scandalous night. Really? That one, uh, yeah, and I was just, I, lis- I was listening to it. I was like, oh my goodness, this is so beautiful. Yeah, um, I love that song. Yeah, I've been doing that song Good Friday for years. Except I've been here for four years and never heard it. It's because uh, we don't do a lot of music on Good <laughs> Friday. Usually, they've been experiences most of the time. So, so. it was, it was, it was a de- like I thought that whole thing was a delight. And yes, we got to start with some of Peter's journey, and I touched on Peter the week before as well. Yeah. Um like he's his call story. Yeah. Um which, which is interesting because the John 21 passage that we landed in today uh, this this Sunday. Some people have said, "Oh, that's just John playing one of his John like games." Um John does, it would seem, depending on how you read scripture, like to move events around in a convenient way. Now, again, we and we've talked about this so many times on the podcast. Huge problem for people living in the Enlightenment era, modernity. Like, above all things, if we're not careful, we worship chronology. Yeah. Like, we're like, tell the story right. Like, don't move things around. And... Yeah. and How dare you be creative? <laughs> <laughs> I, you did that before. The that, scientific that revolution yeah. has really wrecked our creativity. <laughs> Let's be honest. Like... And we thought we nailed it until uh-huh. we realized we didn't. And so, now we're yes. like, there's a whole generation realizing that uh, maybe the power of metaphor is useful to the yeah. world. So, so if that's your world, if, if that's your premise for how information is passed, that's okay. Just know that before like 1700, nobody cared. Uh, storytelling was an art form and you could move events around in order to tell the story that you wanted to tell so a good example of john's seeming moving of the story is is the um the cleansing of the temple yeah almost the other three gospel writers all agree that jesus cleansed the temple he went in and he threw out the money changers towards the end of his ministry in the week leading up to crucifixion Mm -hmm. john puts it right at the start three years before um now it could be that he did it twice, but if he did it twice, then they shouldn't be surprised like the second time. It's like, yeah. Wait, this guy does that every time he comes here. Okay, so then, um, all right, since we're obsessed with chronology, does that undermine the accuracy of the scriptures? No, because because they're writing from the premise that they're interested in. Like, the, again, chronology is... It's yeah, but then it's, then it's a human author who's, like, driving the agenda of the text. Yeah, yeah, and, and God seems to be quite comfortable with some of the humanness, as we discovered in the moment that John wants to tell everyone that he's faster than Peter. <laughs> which is, 
Which no, just God so wanted funny. everyone to know that John was faster than well, Peter. Yeah, apparently so. Yeah, yeah. It's like, it's Jesus really, is like, I yeah. really, I really think it's important that this particular disciple is known as the fastest. So therefore, I will dictate this to him. Well, and, and broadly gospel. speaking, there's what maybe four positions that people have held on on how inspiration of scripture works. So, like the 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 most detailed one is. Dictation theory. Yeah. It is dictation theory, yeah. yeah. Is man sitting writing as an angel, usually an angel, even though that's never mentioned, but in the pictures that are created for it, it's always an angel. Yeah. He's stood in a corner looking over his shoulder, saying, Write this, and he's giving them each word. Yep. Um now the, there's loads of str- problems with that theory once you get into textual criticism, like once yeah. you start looking at some of the details. Uh, and then the, then that theory progresses all the way through to God inspired a man and inspired him to write specific things. Uh, and then uh, on the, maybe the far end, like God inspired him to write something. Does that make sense? Like, yes. am I saying that well? Like, in, in terms of like... Like, I feel moved, I'm going to write a story. Yeah. And that's probably like and the, the, none of the specifics are actually God breathed. They're just like uh-huh. he was. It's kind of like a love song that you know, a songwriter meets a girl and is inspired by her and writes a song. But the words Did themselves don't actually, actually matter. Does she even exist? All those yeah. different questions. Yeah. Yeah. So, so th- that's the theories that you could describe. It, it would be a fallacy to say that it was simply that's conservative through to liberal. I think there's actually some people that have a distinctly conservative view of scripture that would not hold to the extreme view of every single word being inspired. Yeah. Um, but but that, those have been wrestled with over the years. Somewhere it seems that the obsession we have with chronology is not the obsession the writers have, and then perhaps not God's obsession either. Yeah, I mean that's that's the challenging part. Like we think perfect chronological, so if God is perfect, He's got His chronology perfect. Yeah, um, and then you only have to tap into things like um, quantum physics and stuff like that to know, like, well, what actually is time, and how does that actually operate, and all those different things. Yeah, all gets a little quirky. Yep. It seems the most logical explanation is that John wants to show something through the temple cleansing story, so he moves it to the start to to say this really defines what Jesus came to do on a broader scale. He came to bring cleansing. He came to bring something new. Know that as you enter into the story. Yeah. Um, Some people have said that the catch of miraculous fish, because John doesn't mention it any other time, is not a second catch of miraculous fish. It's the first catch that John puts in a different place. So this John 21 story. Yeah. I don't think that has to be true. And I actually have always read it as just a second time that Jesus does this because it makes so much sense for it to be a second time. Yes, absolutely. Um, And the instructions are different and all these different things. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't quite. Well, the instructions are the same, right? No. Isn't, doesn't he just say, cast your nets on the other side of the boat? Or I cast think, your nets, nets to the right side of the boat? I think it's the scene that's different. I think they're different. I think the instructions are different. We're, we're going to have to figure that out now. Yeah, so the first example is... In a well-prepared podcast, we'd already know. But <laughs> <laughs> All right, so... Uh, oh, wow. Okay. I guess I got to restart my... So, like... Are we talking about like Luke's account, for example? Yeah, Luke chapter five. Luke um, five is the first one. Um, you saw the water's edge, two boats. There's fishermen. Let down the nets for a for a catch. Yeah, so it could be that it's the other side of the boat. Yeah, I I think so. And when I'm they to remember when what... he'd finished speaking, so he got into the boat. So, yeah, he's in the boat. Very different. Yeah. Um, Water's Edge. He's teaching, right? Yeah. So he's now, that's teaching. what I mean. The scene is different. The certainly. scene is different. And then the instructions. And the instructions so much are, are, are much more specific, I think, in John's. 
John 21, it actually says, one, he's on the beach. Throw your nets on the right side of the boat. Now, what is like Matthew's? Do you know what Matthew's? I don't know what the reference is. I'd guess like it's somewhere around Matthew 8 or 9, is it? Um, oh, it's got to be earlier than that, right? Well, Three. you know, it's not going to be before. No, because it's not before the Sermon on the Mount. All right, I can just Google it. So Matthew, catch a fish. Just Does he have it? I don't know if they do. Matthew 4. Oh, see? Oh, there we go. Matthew, oh, I said three, four. Either way. Um, preach. Come follow me. Oh, oh so he doesn't have it. Or at least it's not, not that. Not the same way. He says, he says the Fisher's a men section. Yeah. And then Mark. Mark one. Oh yeah, that's right. Mark Mark actually uses this story as, as one of the f- frameworks for his baptism. Jesus announces the good news, calls his first disciples, and it's just the "Come follow me." Yeah. So actually, it's only in in Luke, Luke, Luke and John. Yeah, which is rare because the Synoptic Gospels, um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, tend to be more similar. And John's usually the outlier. Mm, yeah. So we're both right-ish. Yeah. It's a draw. So so if, <laughs> if, if Wikipedia has any credence, uh, it says that there were two. Um, and there are some distinct differences, like the, ca- the, the, the counting of the fish specifically. Yeah. I would say it's easier to read that there's two. Some scholars have said, no, there's just one. Um yeah, but and that was the focal point of Peter's, to me, of of some of his redemption arc. The, and this is actually, <laughs> this is actually the irony of some textual criticism to me, mm-hmm. or the weirdness of textual criticism to me is like sometimes the obsession that people have with some of these little details blinds them from the meaning of the story. <laughs> like, totally. I mean, I think it's helpful in certain senses. It, it like it helps you analyze this text deeply well i think the I, textual criticism i i think the textual criticism movement is probably done a good job at unearthing other ancient sources to give mm-hmm. us literary devices and yeah. figures of speech and do, has done a horrible job of actually assembling anything helpful as far as chronology. Yeah. Well, well, and I, it's a very modern obsession versus an ancient one. I, I think, to me, like so, so the beautiful thing about the church and about scripture, I think, and, and actually then, therefore, about Jesus as well, Yeah, is the, the connection between divine and human. So the... There, there is an importance, it seems, to the fact that G- Jesus is both God and man. The church yeah. is both spirit operated and and relies on human beings. Scripture yeah. is both divinely inspired and has a distinct humanness to it. You know something about Mark, Luke, and John as authors, even they have if a literary like, style. They, they, yeah, they have favorite words that they use. Yeah. Uh, and so, to me, there's this extreme you can go to that takes the humanity out of Scripture and says all, all they did was just move the pen. Yeah. You know, and they almost like were in a trance as they did it, and there was no involvement whatsoever. Yep. And then there's this other level, like, that the textual critics can go to, which is, like, no, there's no divine in it whatsoever. It's just humans writing human stories. Yep. And both of them lose something, it seems to me. Both just as yes, a theology that, that says Jesus is just God or just man loses something as well. Yeah. So so I think that I'm gonna tighten this for you. So oh thanks. Yeah, where'd it go? <laughs> it looks like it's so 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 there I think that is something that um that I love about reading scripture. I don't yeah. think it matters if Luke is writing and he says, you know what, Mark already said this section really well. I'm just gonna use the words he used. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm not sure that that 
actually takes away the divine nature of scripture and all that, all those different things that we we hold really I think valuable. we should probably define textual criticism for folks out there yeah. because maybe not everyone knows <laughs> yeah. what is textual criticism go on then no you go for it hmm? so so <laughs> so textual criticism is like very broadly is how the manuscripts were put together so we have these documents Matthew Mark and Luke they share some common passages so the textual criticism movement, which might on a broader level incru- include like editorial criticism and those different sub subtypes, it really is looking at like the details of how the manuscripts came to be. And so somewhat problematically for some people as, as these theories developed was, well, the sections of Luke that are word for word there in Mark a word for that word there in Matthew. So they actually started to like try and piece together an original document, right? Like Q was the document for a while. I think most people have said, no, Q's probably not a real thing. It's it's probably like oral tradition. Yeah. Or, but but for a while there was like, well, no, there was this document that we've lost that Matthew read, that Mark read and Luke read, and they both took elements from it and they both added elements of Matthew. And then they all kind of like start to see this pattern that, and this all together. happens through the Old Testament and everything as well. Yeah. And so part of the goal of textual criticism is to try and figure out who's the author. Yeah. What sources did they use? What era, generation were they writing in? And all, that is all really important data to have in order to interpret things because you start to, like, if they're writing in this era, you know, decade or this generation, yeah. they'll have a different set of figures of speech. If they're writing from another city, they might use um, slang or lingo from that city or that region. Yeah, yeah. And so if they can determine those things, it actually helps you understand the sort of vocabulary yeah. of that era and generation. So it was, it's a worthwhile pursuit, Yes, but a lot of textual critics over the years have kind of gone off gangbusters and like yes. uh well if this ver- if this book uses the same word as this one then obviously this one's first and that one's completely yes. hogwash and like yeah it's and, it's, and, and yeah. so so you see it like so like daniel famously there was a lot of texture criticism around daniel it, it's a, a strange old testament book because it uses aramaic and it uses hebrew um, and some of the words it uses seem like they're way later than the 6th century when the book seems to be set. They're words that we use more in the 2nd century. Does that mean it was actually written in the 2nd century? Does that matter that it was written in the 2nd century? You see this with Genesis in Genesis chapter 1, in Genesis chapter 2. Why are the two creation accounts for some people? One was a priestly account that came later. One was uh, the Yahwehist. He wrote, for, and it goes on and on and on as people try and pull this thing apart. It, and they, you know, some of the textual criticists, criticists started to um, try and explain away certain theological problems Mm -hmm. using textual criticism and that's where i feel like it goes a little bit off the rails in a lot of ways yeah and and so one of those big ones that i recall um was somewhere in the old testament you see language that suggests god's covenant with israel is it's certain defined it has no part for the people of israel to play it it yeah. cannot be broken. Their actions don't matter. And yeah. then later there's, there's parts that suggest that, no, they do have a part to play in maintaining the covenant. There's responsibilities. So you start to see that in some of the, the different ways that the Ten Commandments are presented in different parts of the, of the Old Testament. It can certainly get you to a point where you say, oh, my goodness, like, all of the divineness of this has been pulled out now. Yeah. Uh, and that's really what we're getting at as a heartbeat. Like this this book that we have, this book of books is both divinely inspired and God used human beings to write those divinely inspired words. Which I think... Um, and that's beautiful. I think that just, that doesn't weaken the sovereignty of God. I think if anything, it strengthens it mm. because God is so capable of accomplishing his will in the world that he chose 
the, the sometimes mostly foolish human mm-hmm. beings that are flawed to enact his will in the world. It and the fact that he would relinquish maybe not relinquish is the right term, but like participate with human communication in order uh-huh. to articulate his desires for the world. Yeah. I think that just makes him even more brilliant. Yes. Not yeah. less. Yes. If he if he really, really wanted to make sure there was no doubt mm-hmm. on any text, on any subject matter that he is really important to his heart, he would make every text like a dictionary mm-hmm. or an encyclopedia yeah. entry uh, entry and he would have dictated it exactly, and it would have it would have been a really boring and really explicit book. Yeah, and we would know black and white where everything is. And he decided not to do it that way. Well, well, that 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 <laughs> I had a New Testament professor in the first seminary I went to, and and he he was a guy that liked to wind you up a little bit, like he could push buttons. <laughs> and uh, and and he he uh, he kind of looked at us maybe first second class, and he was like, so you he was an Indian guy like still had his deep Indian accent like every time you got an answer right he'd look at you go very good Alex <laughs> like he was just, like it was so, <laughs> that's awesome so fun um, <laughs> that's, that's pretty rewarding but, yeah oh yeah yeah very uh, but but he 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 sat down with us, he or he stood in front of us and he said so you first year students uh, you think the Bible's perfect huh. And he read us Psalm 139, verse 7. You know, happy are those that take your little ones and smash them against the rocks. Yeah. I said, so what do you want to do with that? Like, is that God's word to us? Like, is he endorsing that? Or is that human human feelings, emotions that he allows to be in his holy book? And we're all just like deer in the headlights. We've got no, like, I have no confidence to say anything about this. Like, just, you know, uh, and, and, he, 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 and like, again, still pushing buttons. He said, guys, if you want something perfect, go and read the Quran. Um, uh, he said, because over years and years, every version that disagrees with another version, one has been picked and the other one's been removed. And it's been refined and cut and cut and cut to the point that there is one endorsed version that everybody agrees on and, yeah. and everything else has disappeared. He says, but but he said, when you come to to scripture, he said, there's so many elements to it that seem to contain human emotions, seem to contain feelings, seem to allow editors choices, like we've just been talking about. Like God seems to be very comfortable with Mark squishing two stories together to give you a point, and 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 we even call it a Mark and sandwich. Like we've got a we've got a name for it. And he says, like the the, yeah. the scripture doesn't work like that. But he said, but it's alive and it's transformative. Yeah. In fact, I think I would argue it's even more powerful and more beautiful because God did mm-hmm. it that way. Yeah. Because, again, Scripture's agenda is not to be um, chronologically mm-hmm. accurate in every situation mm-hmm. and scientifically um, a, a, a scientific document in every in every uh, thing it articulates it's its agenda is to transform your life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Its agenda is to help you encounter the living God. Yes. And if, if that's the agenda, it is a perfect, incredible transformative book and has proven itself over and over again as the best means by which yes. to transfer, you know, uh, transform people's lives. Now we get like this with our mm-hmm. scientific revolution and, or, um, chron- I chronology. Wish, I wish people listening on podcast could actually see what you're doing. They've right got. Now. I've got my little um, blinders, little blinders <laughs> up for, for like a horse has those blinders so they can stay focused on the race. Yeah, like we we just get so focused on things that concern us when mm-hmm. it comes to what we would consider a powerful or valid document. Yeah, and we lose the transformative power if we do that. We, we absolutely do. And, and so I think a, a really easy, quick example of how this works is we actually read two resurrection accounts on Easter Sunday. Yeah. We read Luke 24 and we read John chapter 20. And in John, in, in Luke 24, it says that three women, I think, went to the, the grave. Yeah. Um, and in John 20, it just says Mary Magdalene. 
and in another version i think it says mary and salome and uh, like i think in mark it says mary and salome and uh, and so in terms of if you were stood there watching one of those is right and two of them are wrong like either mary went by herself or she didn't either mary and salome went or so and so went or or whatever again like that's not the concern of the writers john's deep concern is he wants to see the trend he wants you to see and know the transformative journey that mary magdalene went on yeah that she at some point stood face to face with the risen jesus and and he was revealed to her and he wants you to know it seems that that same experience could be yours yeah, that you too could stand face to face with, the and it's a very Jesus. common thing for John to hyper focus on one individual exactly. at a yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. Even if there's others in the actual yes. real life uh-huh. story, John seems to want to zoom in, yes. super tight angle Absolutely. lens yeah, on yeah. that individual. And our, yeah. and our understanding is no, no, that you shouldn't, you shouldn't do that. And and that and when we actually get to it, we're like, well, well, why not? If we actually spend time thinking about our tension with that but again scientific revolution all those different things and you only need to interview four people about a car crash and you'll see exactly what you see with the gospel writers yeah um one person will say the car was purple the other say they'll say it was maroon uh another person will say no this car came from there and this car came from there another person will say well no it was like this time of day another person will say it was that time of day They'll bring different details, but the main details, they all agree on. Yeah. Um, Well, I actually think the question that we got from Sunday is a reflection of an editorial decision that you made. Yes, probably so. Yeah. On Sunday. So here's the question that came in from Easter Sunday. It says, it says this, I was at both services Easter morning. I thought it was a good sermon and I really liked Kim's testimony, but I was confused both times I heard this line. If Jesus was wrong about Jesus, then maybe Jesus was wrong about Peter. I think the wording was close to what was said, or mm-hmm. that wording was close to what was said. I believe the previous statement was that the word saw, the world saw that Jesus was wrong, question mark. Well, I, I did watch the video again and pretty much figured out, even though in, um, initially it hit me as rather strange and drastic. So I think the question that is getting here, oh, let me see if there's a final question here. Anyway, a couple other people that I talked to agreed that it was a rather confusing statement. So I thought maybe you would like to uh, readdress and explain it more. Hmm. So um, I I knew what you were communicating Uh because we dialogued. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you were moving very efficiently through a character development yeah. piece. And so maybe there was a sentence or two that you could have added to like clarify the character development yeah. significance of that. Yeah. But can you can you describe what your intention of descri- of that sentence yeah. was? So, so I think all the way through I was trying to, and this is one of those fun examples of how you can feel like you say something that's really clear and someone else is like, that wasn't that clear. Yeah. Um, which is, is typical of com- communication. Um, I think in America, we tend to put the burden of that on the person that's doing the communicating, um, which is not true everywhere in the world, but it, but it's certainly true here. Um, so, so for me, the goal is like in that section is we're trying to unpack what Peter might be, might like be feeling, experiencing in those moments based on the data we have. So, so to me, Something has happened with Peter in that story we unpacked on Palm Sunday. He's experienced Jesus, and Jesus has said to him, in words that we wouldn't necessarily understand, um, you can be more than you are right now. Actually, the term fisher of men is, men is not a terrible pun. It was actually language of the day that was used regularly about what rabbis did. Yes. Like when you told a story, you were fishing for people. Yeah. Um, you like were trying you, to catch them. You're no something. long. You're no longer have to be the outcast of society. I'm going to actually invite you mm-hmm. to be a student of a rabbi, which yeah. is a huge elevation. Yeah. And so Jesus, Jesus was retelling Peter's story. Yes. 
first example. And, yeah. and doing that based on the premise, I think for Peter, like when Peter chooses to follow him, what what makes him believe that Jesus has the authority, the knowledge, the divine calling to enable him to do that? Like he believes something about Jesus because of the catch of fish, because of the way that Jesus has taught, some mix of the two. And because he believes that about Jesus, when 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 Jesus tells him something that on the face of it is absurd, like every piece of data in Peter's life outside of his meeting with Jesus <laughs> tells him, no, I can't do that. I have been told very concretely by the education system, I can't do that. Yeah. This is like a guy getting cut in his freshman year from a sport and someone coming along and saying, oh, yeah, I see an NFL future for you. Yeah. Uh, it like there's so much data. You're gonna be our star pitcher. Yeah, 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 like, yeah, I yeah, threw yeah. my arm out when I was seven. Yeah, you know? it's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it wasn't I've, much of an arm to begin yeah, with. I have a like, torn yeah. rotator cuff. There's no chance yeah, that's yeah, ever yeah, gonna yeah. happen. So, so does Peter has plenty of data that tells him that this is nonsense. But Jesus, being Jesus, is enough for Peter to say okay and to start the journey with him. Yeah. When Jesus dies, what does that mean? Well, it means that Jesus wasn't right about who Jesus says he was. Like, like Jesus has presented something from Peter's perspective. From Peter's and perspective, and maybe that's yeah. the one line that could have clarified it for this person. But, but also, for, but, but also from from right at that moment, from the whole world's perspective, I, th I think I said yeah, yeah, something yeah. like, but I think not it, from Jesus's perspective. Well, no, obviously. absolutely. Yeah, Jesus uh, knows the agenda, but yeah. from, from the outside looking in, he dies. Even if he resurrects, like the the world is expecting a political revolutionary. Mm -hmm. The world is expecting um, power and strength mm -hmm. and greater and greater influence. Like, this is the way of the world. It's like all yeah. this stuff. And so when he dies, well, even though he resurrects, the the script is off off a plan, right? In Peter's yeah, mind. And, 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 and we tend to look back. I think I'm, I'm trying to think if we even read this piece of the text. I think we're actually going to look at it this week. I think I just referenced it without reading it. When he appears to the disciples without Thomas and then to the disciples with Thomas, it specifically says they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. So we tend to think of like, at this point, resurrection to them is a certainty and all the implications that we carry with it 2,000 years later are now fully locked in their minds. That they're like, oh yeah, let's go, like, let's let's do this thing. Like, this is amazing. Yeah, like it, it's not. That's not how the story is presented. The story is presented with room for doubt, even in the midst of resurrection. Room for doubt about what's happened. Room for doubt about what it means for you, what it means for this world, wow. all those different things. Wow. Like for for whatever reason, like to us, we're like, no, they should just know now. They should know all the things that we know. And and for whatever reason, the writers are really clear that they don't all feel like that at all. Um, th there's a sinking in, a processing, a shock factor that, that, is, that is pretty clear in the text. So when Jesus dies, I would suggest there's enough other data in Peter's life to be able to tell him, okay, maybe the one person that said something different about me didn't really know who they were, therefore doesn't really know who I am. Yes. And and certainly the fact that he goes back fishing is a significant part of his story. Yeah. It's not... This like, thing that he gave up to follow this mm -hmm. revolutionary leader, Yeah, he goes back to. It's yeah. it's like him reverting to his old past. Yeah. And, yeah. and and we, 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 of course, because I because almost no one in our culture actually fishes for a living. Yeah. We read it as a hobby, even if we don't think we do. We're like, oh yeah, he went for a fishing trip. Of course he did. Like, it's a reasonable thing to do. So no, no, this guy had to walk a, a significant distance, had to find a mechanism with which to go fishing again. Now, whether it was a family boat or yeah, whatever. Yeah, it's an like, all you know, night endeavor with yeah. sweat and yeah. This energy. isn't a hobby trip. No, this is a career choice uh -huh. decision. Yeah. yeah. And 
And and so I think a reasonable take on that is that, yeah, the dream is over. Yeah, and so even if, even, maybe, and again, we're hypothesizing a little bit about what Peter's feeling here, which is strangely what you're supposed to do with narrative. Like, mm-hmm. at, you're supposed yeah. to be wondering what these characters mm-hmm. are feeling and thinking in order to interpret a narrative well. Um, but even if he didn't, even if Peter believes Jesus was right about his thing. He's he's lost faith in his own part in that story. Yeah. If anything, yeah. if anything, the story is pretty clearly communicating that. Yeah, that he's given up on him participating yes. in this story. Yeah, and, and and yes, even if Jesus is resurrected and and back, why would he believe in Peter again? Yeah, Peter denied him. Yeah. Peter is the sort of the loser of this of the losers of all uh-huh. of the disciples in this situation. Well, he's the one that's bragged the most and the one that's failed the most. <laughs> yeah. So it's like if he's got these Great. like two things like in either end, he's like Yeah. He's talked a good story. So he's like the guy to keep our sports analogy going, which is actually helpful in this, you know, where some sports analogies are super forced. He's the guy that's talked total smack before the game. And has not shown up at all. Like maybe like Russell Wilson. <laughs> that was pretty I, rough, man. I, I love a Broncos joke oh, as much as the man. next person. That was pretty rough. Uh, he's like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get four more, and then yeah, he's yeah. like, not. Like. That's right. Um, yeah, and he, now he's eating, eating it every day. Yeah. So, so I think I love the way that that Jesus goes around healing that narrative for him. Like on multiple levels, like there's the there's the fireside that's exactly like, you know, you can, you can picture Peter totally in this world where every time he smells campfire, <laughs> triggered. Yeah, it's like <laughs> oh, not again. No. Yeah. Um. I I I. I was in England maybe. I think four years ago, and I had a rental car stolen. Wow, and and the the they looked to start with like they were going to try and deny the claim on the insurance. Dang! Like, like I didn't have the keys, so I either left them in the car or dropped them on the floor, or they stole them from the house. Um, and I had no way of proving which was which, and so like you know they could have argued negligence, all these different things. It just felt like it was hovering in the air, and I was like, look, I'm very clear, like I don't know what happened to them, like I lost them somewhere, like. And this car was worth, you know, thirty thousand dollars, and they wanted the money ASAP. And wow! And it was a mini Mini Cooper. And every time I drove down four seventy towards the mountains, past the mini garage, it just gave me like this, just like shivers down my spine. I was just like, Ugh. I was so mad with myself, so mad with the situation, and and it was just like there on the highway, laughing at me. And I was thinking about like the hundreds of dollars I was going to have to pay every month to to pay off this car um, that that had been stolen. Wow. And then one day I just got a, a check through the mail that was it was just a photocopy of a check that just said we sent this to the the rental agency. It was for thirty thousand dollars. Wow! They just, they just suddenly just paid it. Um, and, and somewhere like there's a similar thing going on with Peter's story. There's the there's the like the the horror of the campfire. Now yeah. I drive past the mini factory and every time I drive past, I'm like, oh yeah. 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 Um, and so, so, so back to this line, if Jesus was wrong about Jesus, then maybe Jesus was wrong about Peter. So, so the clarifying statement is that again, we're thinking from mm-hmm. Peter's perspective, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus thinks Jesus was wrong uh-huh. about himself. No, and, no, no. Jesus doesn't. I mean, no, that. Peter thinks that Jesus was wrong uh-huh. about himself. Yeah. And Peter is really skeptical that Jesus was right about him. him yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he has clearly proven that he is the 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 only thing he's good at is fishing. Uh huh. And he should have never been invited into this story mm-hmm. in the first place. Yes. So that's to clarify that yeah, what yeah, yeah. was going on there. Mm-hmm. And so he's tapped out of the game. Yeah. Prematurely, and this whole story you told on on Resurrection Sunday last week was a. It was a story of resurrecting his invitation mm. back into the story, mm-hmm. yeah, which is beautiful, yeah, and that's actually kind of what he does over and over and over again with each one of us is he's like, mm-hmm. yeah, you think you're an idiot, you think you're an imposter, a 
um, not as cool as the person next to you. Um, you're a little skeptical that mm -hmm. you should be part of this. If people only knew who you really were, they mm -hmm. wouldn't like you. All yeah. of those questions and doubts and, and, and curiosities. And the thing that Jesus consistently does for us is he invites us in. Yeah. So, so th the number patterns in scripture are, are pretty important. Like symmetry is important. There's 12 tribes of Israel. There's 12 disciples. There's like, you know, 40 comes up regularly. Seven comes up regularly. Three comes up regularly. Yeah. So three denials by Peter, three resurrection appearances by Jesus to the disciples, and three questions from Jesus to Peter. Yep. Do you love me more than these? Uh, yep. Some people have said that these is the fish, the thing that he's doing now. Others has, have said, no, 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 it's, it's pointing back to the disciples because Peter concretely said, even if these guys all betray you. I, yeah, I won't. Implication: I love you more than they do. Yeah, and and you see the the shock confidence of Peter that he can no longer say I love you more than these. The best he can give Jesus is you know that I love you. Maybe not more than these, but I do love you. Yeah, and and that seems to be enough for Jesus. Um, yeah, and and the, so so the 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 message is like feed my sheep, and then and then this super cryptic line that I didn't even get a chance to get to. Uh, where he says to him, I tell you, you know, when you were young, you dressed as you wanted to dress. Yeah. Um, and one day, now you'll live a life where someone will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. And Peter's story will end in crucifixion as well. Uh, yeah. Where not only will he not deny Jesus, but he'll say, I'm not worthy to die in the same way. And the, the, the legend is that, is that he was crucified upside down. Yeah. And I think that, and then there's this wacky little interaction where they, Peter and Jesus are walking down the beach and they turn around and John's sort of following <laughs> them. So John. So wacky. Like, I love that he's willing to write it in as well. It's like, I was just lurking there listening. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I, I always thought like, so Peter says, ask Jesus like, well, what about him? Uh -huh. And it's, it's right on the tail end of this like prediction that he's going to die, mm -hmm. that Peter's going to die. Um, and I always connected those two and, and thought, oh, Peter wants to know whether John's also going to be martyred. Yeah. Which would be on brand for him. Yeah. On both of and them. And I think that's obviously a possible yeah, reading yeah. and that's how I've always read this passage. But then this last time I read it, I wonder if it was still self-doubt. Mm. Yeah. I wonder if actually he turns around and he's been invited back into the story oh, by Jesus yeah, 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 yeah. and he turns around and he says, that guy didn't abandon you yeah, yeah. the way I did. Yeah, yeah. Like he, he abandoned you a little bit, but not, he's hovering always behind you. He didn't yeah. deny I mean, you. only in his story to yes, be yes, yes. fair. <laughs> enough. But, he, but he's, and Peter's like saying, why not pick him to lead the church? Mm. Why did you mm. pick me? I'm, st I'm the idiot who yeah, denied you. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Jesus says, he's got his own story. Yeah, yeah. I like I've that. I've got yeah. your story. Yeah, and I think fair. it might be. Yeah. It's the first time I've ever read it this way. Um, yeah. Well, jo John feels like he'd be an awful leader of the church. <laughs> like, it feels like he's he's got these monk-like tendencies that I always read in him. Like, he'd, like, he'd want to sit around, like, like, actually doing something, like... I don't know if you do that. I don't know. I don't know. I just feel like... Yeah, I don't know. I feel like he's the, the spiritual powerhouse of the church, but they picked well in Peter's, like, you know... Peter get, will get up in Acts after the Holy Spirit fills him, and he'll give that killer address. Yeah. Um, feels like the rock was a good choice. Yeah. Exactly. Jesus knew what he was doing. Yeah. Anything else you want to share about... No. Resurrection I'm Sunday? just amazed. That like, was what, fun. what time was it? It's 53. Look at us. Wow. 20 minutes serving into 53 minutes of content. Are, are you proud of us? Are you mortified? <laughs> <laughs> Finally, a short episode. I don't nah. know. Psych. No <laughs> short episodes here. We don't want to be a highly... You, you got a short <laughs> sermon. <laughs> don't expect a short episode. We don't want a, a highly viewed podcast or listened to podcast. We just want a moderately well listened <laughs> oh, to man. podcast. Oh. All right, well, we uh, are grateful for you all. Mm -hmm. Like, subscribe on YouTube, and give us a review on your podcast service. Oh, yeah. Um, and, yeah, give us some feedback on what's helpful, what's not helpful. Things like that might be might be mm -hmm. good for us. I love we, it. We, 
we could probably use some feedback at this point. <laughs> some constructive criticism. I mean, we mock helpful. ourselves incessantly, but we don't do anything about it. So, we, like, if we, you start we, mocking us, then maybe we'll actually adjust. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. We'll see. What a dream. All right. See you.